very much for staying, and I see that are a lot of empty <laughs> chairs now, so I'm kind of relieved to <laughs> give my talk. But so, uh, so Kazia told me to talk about this uh, yellow title, like a you know, big theme, uh, applied linguistics. So I'm the final applied linguistic presenting today, and perspective on successful L2 grammar learning. And here's my title, more specific title. Called, I'm focusing on cognitive aptitude for second language grammar acquisition, and I'd like to propose. Uh, the theory-driven approach uh, to study the role of aptitude for second language acquisition, but I'm surprised to see that Katya and Andre's talk that a lot of overlaps uh, between your topics and uh, uh, what I'm going to talk talk about now, right? So uh, here's the overview of what I'm going to talk about uh, today. And so yeah, it's, uh, slides are a little bit different from what I'm seeing here, but uh, so three things. Uh, so first, I'd like to. Uh, explain what is successful uh, L2 grammar learning uh, from the perspective of explicit and implicit learning and collective procedural automatization uh, perspectives. And then I'm going to explain, uh, I'm going to offer some account of how uh, successful L2 grammar learning can be achieved through the individual difference approach. Then I'm going to show, uh, show you a brief uh, review of the literature on the role of procedural uh, memory abilities. Okay. So, uh, here, uh, like you know, the two previous speakers have been discussing the issue of explicit and implicit uh, teaching, learning, and pro uh, learning processes, and because they are essential concepts for tackling important issues from both theoretical and pedagogical points of view. And from this perspective, then what is successful L2 grammar learning? And here, I'd like to uh, give you the brief, uh, already because uh, I gave this. Uh, definition by explicit declarative knowledge uh, refer to rules and exemplars and they are usually used consciously and slowly and gradually like a practice through practice uh, it can be like you know more like access faster and on the other hand implicit and procedural knowledge are defined as major source of knowledge for L2 performance uh, because they are accessed quickly without consciousness uh, for communication purposes and here are the three levels of analysis in SLA research and teaching. First, like you have like explicit and implicit instruction, and followed by learning and resulting knowledge are uh, usually uh, defined as explicit or declarative and implicit and procedural uh, knowledge. And one of the key questions for both practitioners and researchers in the field is how does L2 instruction influence the development of explicit and implicit knowledge? And these uh, theories are tied to the neurobiological basis of the memory system and explicit declarative system is stored in the hippocampus and other medial temporal lobe structures. On the other hand, uh, implicit procedural knowledge are stored in different parts of the brain and usually are considered uh, to reside in the basal ganglia and inferior, uh, left inferior frontal regions. And here I'd like to make two points about the two systems uh, can develop in parallel and arguably with some like a synergy between them, or like a, uh, some researchers call them interface between the two systems. And implicit procedural knowledge is typically considered to be the goals of sec uh, second language learning, uh, the grammar learning in both, and successful uh, grammar learning. Okay. So, having laid out uh, the like, theoretical framework, I'd like to offer you how we can study the individual differences in these uh, two types of systems. And as we all know, that like, uh, the convincingly showed that there are considerable variations in attainment in adult SLA. And here, after the age of like, fast exposure uh, to L2, the attainment, the, the here indicated by the y-axis here, is considerably, uh, considerably uh, variable among adult SLA. And, sorry. and what kind of individual difference factors uh, can predict successful L2 grammar learning in particular, and also like L2 proficiency in general? And so uh, this is uh, Professor Sugiula mentioned the motivation, uh, personality facets, and the talent uh, we've been discussing, the focus of uh, this symposium is uh, cognitive ability or the aptitude and experience, like how much uh, exposure and input and their practice uh, the like second language learners engage. And 
here's an interesting uh, hypothesis uh, proposed by uh, Kathy Daly. And all else being equal hypothesis, this is uh, like a new study, uh, paper published in Language Learning, and she makes a strong uh, hypothesis regarding the role of aptitude. And all, be, all else being equal means the motivation is high, and personal, uh, personality facets are aligned, and learning context is excellent. So, for example, like if you're constantly using second language uh, for business or like at home, and all of these uh, conditions are met, does aptitude still predict the success in adult second language acquisition? And she convincingly showed uh, by the data of like, uh, you, uh, the U.S. government uh, officials that aptitude still makes uh, like it, make, it explains the variability of the attainment, especially the really high level attainment. And so cognitive ability uh, plays a uh, like significant role in adult uh, second language acquisition. And here, because uh, when we talk about aptitude, there are tons of aptitude components as we are already seeing. And the number of aptitude components can become infinite for predicting different aspects of L2 grammar learning and of course other domains. Because like, second language acquisition is like, really complex and we are not sure what kind of aptitude components we should focus on, right? So here now I'd like to uh, point out that we need a focus set of significant traits that are theoretically supported for predicting success successful L2 grammar learning. And then how should we select those uh, like significant traits for research and teaching? Here, uh, here like I like to uh, explain two uh, the converging uh, theoretical frameworks that explains about the, uh, the conceptualizations of the aptitude types. Uh, one is proposed by Gisela Granena, and she proposed the, uh, she kind of reconceptualized aptitude component for explicit and implicit uh, processes. And explicit learning aptitude uh, uh, like should represent a conscious reflection of a linguistic input, and the representative task is Kazia's favorite uh, aptitude test, uh, LAMA, and LAMA AF is ling uh, language analytic ability. Uh, type of uh, subcomponent uh, sub of aptitude and implicit learning aptitude uh, represent uh, unconscious pattern induction or recognition, so serial reaction time, uh, so called SRT task, and LAMA D task, which is also come from the subtest of LAMA test battery, and primability. And I'm going to focus on SRT task, and this is widely used in SLA research, especially in naturalistic acquisition context, and I'm gonna explain briefly uh, later on, right? Uh, however, uh, so I think uh, some of you may know that one of the most traditional uh, tests of aptitude is modern language aptitude test, uh, developed by uh, John Carroll, uh, 1960s, like a really long time ago. And these uh, traditional aptitudes heavily relied on conscious learning processes and are considered as explicit aptitude, according to Granene and other researchers. And MLAT turns out to be a good predictor of L2 learning. And for L2 proficiency, like in general, like in a broader construct of second language acquisition attainment, and correlation coefficients between the MLAT and uh, second language outcome was between 0.4 and 0.6. Okay. And if you uh, calculate the like, you know, uh, explanatory uh, power, then you get like 20 to like 30 percentage. And on the other hand, if you focus more on specific types of knowledge, uh, the acquisition of vocabulary, grammar, and writing, then the uh, correlation coefficient that gets lower, but it still like, you know, accounts for 10% uh, of the uh, variance of the attainment. And, but as uh, like MLAT has been focusing on explicit types of aptitude, uh, much less is known for the role of implicit aptitude. And, the another perspective uh, coming from the neurobiological perspective on the declarative procedure of memory uh, systems. Uh, the Morgan Short and Kara Morgan Short and Michael Ullman, uh, they claim that long-term memory systems, so including uh, like working memory, and serve as an individual difference factor uh, in L2 learning. And Ullman's uh, theory of declarative procedure of memory is uh, one of the promising uh, framework for predicting uh, successful L2 grammar learning. 
an ongoing uh, theory, uh, theorizing of a test battery that taps into two dis different types of uh, memory systems uh, on the way. And here is a candidate uh, test battery of long-term memory systems. So, for example, uh, the correct memory uh, task usually uh, focus on paired associates, so where participants are asked to remember the like you know foreign words matched with their first language. For example, like English speakers are asked to learn the words of like Maya language, unfamiliar languages for two minutes, then you can, they will be tested uh, for the recall. And for this procedure, memory tasks come from a variety of uh, like tasks that are used in cognitive psychology research. One is uh, the one that I talked about, SRT task, uh, serial reaction time task, and tower of London task, and weather prediction task. I'm not going to go into details of all the tasks, but I'm going to uh, pick up one uh, task, SRT task, and explain a little bit here. And so in this talk, so. I've been talking about explicit, implicit, and declarative procedure, but for the purpose of simplicity, like you know, these two words, declarative, explicit, and procedure, implicit, they are used interchangeably in this talk because there are a lot of like overlap between the Gramian's uh, framework and Michael Woman and Morgan Shaw's like framework. Okay, so uh, SRT task uh, taps into uh, the domain general ability to learn probabilistic sequence without awareness. And here's a task, uh, it's a really simple task, and participants are presented uh, with the four squares, and in one of the squares, a dot appears, and their task is to respond to the dot as quickly as they can, and their reaction time, uh, how, lo how long it takes to respond to the dot, is measured uh, in milliseconds, and by what participants didn't know, is, uh, doesn't know, is that uh, there's a hidden rule, probabilistic rule, that they need to pick up. And when they can learn successfully, their reaction time difference uh, emerges. And SRT task has been uh, uh, good to measure for the learning ability of probabilistic rules, or like a dot sequences. This is remotely, uh, this seems really different from like, you know, what, you know, Second language actually second second language learners actually do, but this has been turned out to be a really good predictor of second language acquisition, especially in naturalistic context. Okay, okay. So I think uh, this is uh, this point uh, was slightly alluded by uh, Andreas' talk here, but uh, so if we can uh, conceptualize uh, the aptitude from the declarative and procedural memory perspectives, we can use them as in a window into the black box learning processes. So here's uh, one idea uh, coming from uh, De Kaiser, uh, 2012. And if you can find the positive correlation between one type of aptitude, for example, procedural memory ability, and L2 learning outcome, we can make an inference that procedural learning processes takes place because procedural learning ability has facilitated that learning process and resulting in positive correlation. So if you can that's the, one of the you know, advantages of using that aptitude uh, in L2 research, and not only that selecting uh, the you know best you know the good language learners, but also we can glean in in the learning processes that we can never observe by making an inference between the correlation between the uh, aptitude and learning outcomes. And here I'd like to uh, present some of the recent findings on the role of aptitude for procedural learning, but it's in a kind of emerging uh, like subfield of aptitude research, and I'd like to synthesize some of the uh, major findings here. Okay. And here are like a, three basic key questions and research and about the role of procedural memory, and one is aptitude and context, and I'm just comparing the role of procedural memory ability in classroom settings and study abroad context. And the second key question is about how that role of aptitude uh, differs depending on types of knowledge. And last is again, focusing on classroom research, uh, not classroom research, but also lab-based research, and how instruct instructional treatment uh, effects uh, differ depending on types of aptitude. Okay, and the first point was uh, explained, can, uh, explained by uh, Ferreira, Stunderberg, and Morgan Schultz study, uh, 2018. And the design was short-term longitudinal uh, design, like in, over uh, one semester, 
and participants were 17 classroom Spanish L2 learners. English in the United States, uh, they are labeled as at-home group, and 13 learners who spent uh, 12 to 15 weeks in Spanish-speaking countries, uh, like Spain, Chile, like any other countries, like study abroad group, and they have taken GJT, Grammatical Judgment Test, and EEG while they are performing the GJT, and as a pre-test and post-test. So there are changes before and after the study abroad and also classroom uh, experience was measured. And the results uh, suggested that procedural memory ability, including SRT task, uh, significantly predicted the behavioral and neurocognitive changes only, only among the study abroad group, suggesting that uh, proceduralization or like proceduralization of grammatical knowledge might have taken place only in the study abroad group, not in classroom settings. And for the second key point is uh, knowledge and aptitude uh, type test. And basically here we focus on naturalistic acquisition context, for example, like Chinese speakers living in Japan acquiring uh, Japanese as a second language. Okay. And here I'd like to uh, uh, show you uh, one task that measure the real-time grammar processing, which does not involve the conscious use of uh, linguistic knowledge, and that is a uh, watermarking task. Uh, here, uh, participants uh, like six, uh, in front of the computer and asked to monitor the word presented on the screen, another, for example, and they're told to respond to the target word as quickly as they can by pressing the button when they hear this word in the sentence uh, that they are going to hear. For example, last month we purchased another company in the same area. So when they hear another, they need to hit the button as quickly as they can. However, uh, the researcher manipulated the grammaticality of the sentence so that they can measure their knowledge of uh, past tense here. So, for example, in some contexts, uh, the participant listened to last month we purchased another. Then. If you can detect uh, this grammatical error in real time, they're expected to slow down to respond to this uh, target word because they hear something weird in the sentence, right? So this uh, should happen within like it is 200 and 300 milliseconds. So it's a really brief, short period of time. And while they are focusing on meaning because they, what they are told is that they are going to answer yes, no comprehension questions because uh, this and this kind of task is like an indirect test of grammar knowledge, so they are not told that they will be tested about their grammar knowledge, but they are just asked to listen to the story and they need to answer the comprehension questions. That's uh, the, how the task work, and the grammatical sensitivity index is uh, calculated by uh, subtracting the reaction time in the grammatical sentences uh, from the reaction time in ungrammatical sentences. The more you slow down, then you're more likely to be sensitive uh, to the target uh, grammatical structures. Okay, uh, here are the empirical evidence, and the study was done in Spain, and the other study was in the, done in the US, and the participants were well, uh, Chinese speakers. Basically, a lot of studies that I'm going to show you today is based on Chinese speakers, all right? And they're like, I think, because there are two possible reasons why like, Chinese speakers are really popular in this kind of study. Uh, first, like, there are a lot. Right? <laughs> uh, the secondly, uh, the Chinese has uh, uh, very few uh, morphological features. And second language re researchers are interested in the acquisition, the second language acquisition of grammatical morphemes. And if the second language does have very similar uh, grammatical morpheme systems, in their first language, that's not second language acquisition. It's more like similar, like an you know, analogy from the uh, between the first and second languages. So uh, basically, a lot of research is focusing on Chinese speakers, and it's, uh, they are really you know cooperative and nice people usually. <laughs> and I've been testing a lot of Chinese speakers. All right, and language tests. So they are recruited adult uh, Chinese speakers living in Spain or living in the U.S. And one of the study gave the one monitoring task a real-time comprehension uh, grammar test and the other uh, task was eye tracking while listening task and also this has the same logic as the one monitoring task where participants come in and listen to the story and they're not told that like, they will be tested about their grammar knowledge but they, their grammatical knowledge can be inferred from their eye movement patterns 
and aptitude test, SRT task, and SRT task, as well as in my study, I administered explicit aptitude test. And the results are strikingly similar from very different uh, you know, field of research and found the exact same correlation between SRT and blood morning task performance and SRT and eye movement patterns, okay? not the uh, explicit aptitude. Okay? And another, another study uh, that uh, recruited uh, Chinese speakers in Tokyo and what I have found is that what a Martin task, oh, this is not showing, sorry. Let's kind of block that here somehow. But, so here, sorry, SRT task, right? <laughs> SRT task was significantly correlated with one monitoring task. There was a significant correlation only among those who lived in Japan longer than two years and a half. So only those who have exposed to the massive amount of input and interaction with uh, like Japanese speakers, then they show the correlation between SRT task and one monitoring task. And here the white box is another task, another like grammar test called LCD imitation test where participants are asked to repeat the sentence back where they can, they are allowed to monitor their sentence so they can use their conscious knowledge to perform the task because they involve the production and but they, we didn't find any significant relationship between SRT task and LCD imitation uh, test performance. Right? So like this is a complex relationship between implicit aptitude, implicit knowledge test and uh, explicit knowledge test didn't uh, we didn't uh, correlate with implicit aptitude, but the lengths, the lengths of resistance moderated the relationship between implicit aptitude and implicit knowledge test. And for the work in progress uh, in here in Sendai, I've been here like so many times and I'm allowed to corroborate uh, with like a neuroscientist at uh, Tokyo University and then we, this is an implication study of the Kaiser, uh, so can Kaiser 2015 using an fMRI technique and we recruited, again, <laughs> Chinese speakers in Sendai and the, the preliminary <coughs> results suggest that SRT test performance was the only significant predictor of the activation of the left coded nucleus which is which the area is responsible for implicit procedural elder knowledge and this is consistent uh, with what we have been finding in the behavioral measurements and further corroborate uh, the validity of the SRT task as a measure uh, for implicit aptitude test. Okay, and the last uh, piece of evidence uh, from my dissertation work, uh, so the Kinti Kata 2017, the language learning, and recruited another group of 100 Chinese speakers around Tokyo area, not only in Tokyo, but other areas, uh, coming from uh, Kanto area. And uh, here, the, the, the results, the pattern of results is more complex, but as you can, See on the left side, we measured an implicit aptitude. It's the same old, you know, <laughs> SRT task, and this is phonological short-term memory task, and explicit aptitude LAMA F task, language analytic ability test. And what we have found is that the correlation between implicit aptitude, implicit knowledge was not significant, but slightly lower than the explicit aptitude test. And automatic explicit knowledge that measured by the like, grammatical judgment test it, it includes the conscious use of knowledge was predicted by explicit aptitude. Then automatic explicit knowledge uh, significantly uh, like, predicted the acquisition of implicit knowledge. However, uh, if I take out this uh, path from the uh, automatic explicit knowledge to implicit knowledge, the Correlation that the path from implicit aptitude to implicit knowledge becomes significant. So still, we find the relationship between the two types of knowledge and memory uh, between the two things. And but if we introduce another type of knowledge, the relationship changes. So that here we see some like you know complex relationship between the aptitude and second language knowledge resulting from the use of these like memory systems. Uh, for second language learning. Okay, so let me recap a little bit uh, for the second point so far. And so SRT has turned out to be a consistent uh, significant predictor of implicit knowledge measured by both behavioral real-time processing 
and neural measures, especially among those whose length resistance is relatively longer. And evidence for the interface between explicit and implicit knowledge suggested by my dissertation work. Okay, and the last uh, key question is the aptitude and in instructional treatment. And few studies examine the role of the precision memory in relation to different instruction conditions, not as much as the like, naturalistic acquisition context. And there are like two types of studies, one in practice distribution, and the second one is more popular topic about the provision of explicit roles and feedback. And for the practice distribution, and this is uh, like a recent study where I uh, recruited uh, like 60 Japanese students uh, who came into my lab and engaged in like a four one-hour training sessions for procedurization of novel uh, L2 grammatical morphology. And they were assigned to two groups. One group of, uh, assigned to the like, shorter interval uh, schedule uh, group, like where they come in like a, two, twice in a week. And in the other group, they came in once a, once a week uh, to practice uh, their grammar rules. And procedure memory ability uh, significantly predicted the production of the speed of the morphological uh, targets. And so that's indicated indicators of procedure auto knowledge under the short spaced uh, learning schedules, not under long spaced learning schedule. That suggests that the proceduralization was more con uh, the, sorry, uh, the shorter uh, space line condition was more conducive for the proceduralization of the grammar knowledge compared to the long space line schedule. Here's an interesting interaction between the aptitude type and also the, uh, the practice schedules. And the, set, the last point is the provision of explicit information. And Brio, uh, Schwitz and Morgan Schott found the significant role of procedural learning ability for learning condition with explicit grammar information. However, uh, grammar, uh, Grunenia and Ilman showed procedural memory ability predictive learning gains um, Spanish feminine gender agreement only in the implicit corrective feedback group. So here's some uh, difference between explicit condition and implicit condition. And even more complex patterns emerges uh, by looking at the Tagarelli's uh, study showing the role of procedural memory ability was moderated by the linguistic complexity in the incidental learning conditions. So specifically, uh, the procedural memory ability was associated with the learning of the most complex syntax patterns and the relationship between SLT task and learning outcome was negative. So like it mix all these three studies, just the mixed findings. So we have a lot of like you know <laughs> unknown uh, factors like a, uh, like the working variables in these studies. And let me conclude my talk here that the distinction between explicit declarative and implicit precision memory and knowledge serves as useful theoretical framework for investigating L2 grammar learning and has demonstrated the speech learning as well. And the role of the context classroom versus naturalistic, and needs to be taken into account as well as the types of knowledge developed. And understanding how individual differences in procedural memory influence auto grammar learning as well as declarative memory may allow us to explore successful grammar learning in classroom setting, as indicated and suggested by the naturalistic acquisition research with both behavioral and neurocognitive measures. And here is uh, some thoughts about uh, the future studies and ask and I believe that unexpected territories for this type of research is that which grammatical structures are, are more conducive for the role of individual differences? Is it a simple structure or complex structures? Of course, like the definition of simple and complex structures are really difficult things, but we need to understand how these different grammatical structures, because they, they involve different psychological processes of learning, so we need to fine-tune the investigations into these are how grammar, which grammatical structures and what learning conditions and when, you know, early or like if stages of learning and how these uh, factors determine the learning processes and outcomes. Okay, so that's it. Okay, thank, thank you. you.